Mark Schlossman is a reportage photographer who specialises in travel, especially to Africa and the Far East. He works out of Plough Studios London, which is where I met up with him to record the following interview. And it seems to me from looking at the work that's on your website and in your portfolio that you know, your speciality is probably more for being able to go abroad and go on foreign locations and, uh, to, and work under quite difficult circumstances at, at times. Um, what sort of things do you do, do you do to prepare for those kind of shoots? I mean, if a photographer wanted to follow doing what you're doing, you know, what sort of kind of things would they need to think about? Yeah, a good friend of mine quotes another photographer, and, and, and the quote is, uh, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not reading enough. Um, paraphrasing the old, uh, the, paraphrasing the, the famous Robert Kappa quote about not being close enough. Um, I think doing research ahead of time is, is extremely important. Um, and if you're going away to a place, if you have an idea, um, talk to other colleagues who have been there, try and find, or colleagues, friends of friends who have been to a place, and and, and find out as much as you can from them. Um, um, I, made a, I made a trip to the Congo and I decided I was going to read a novel. I think that's sometimes a good way. Not to read three novels, but one. One very good sort of definitive novel about a place. So I read V.S. Naipaul's uh, book, A Bend in the River. When I knew I was going to Kisangani in the Congo, um, it gave me some, uh, sort of a map in my head, a picture of what was, of what was there. So not Joseph Conrad then? Uh, Conrad would be concentrating on a slightly different aspect. <laughs> I've read Heart, era, yeah. I've read Hearts of Darkness. It's a yeah. I've read Heart, Heart of Darkness. It's a brilliant book, but yeah, yeah quite quite negative. It's interesting that you mentioned the Congo because I remember reading a book by an author, Jeffrey Taylor, called Facing the Congo. And incidentally, one of his pictures, you know, the picture on the cover, was one of your, your photographs. Um, and the story that he told of coming in, I think it was through Brazzaville to uh, cross over the Congo uh, to go to Kinshasa. It was a nightmare journey. And, um, and he'd been prepared beforehand because he knew who he needed to talk to, who he needed to bribe and things like that. But you got definitely the picture that this wasn't a journey for anybody who wasn't uh, brave enough to sort of deal with that or be resourceful enough to be able to know how to handle that situation. My time in the Congo was, was a good example of getting the opportunity to talking to somebody about something and they, them saying, well, what, I'll introduce you to so-and-so, and they're working out there. And I kept this line of communication going and eventually arranged a trip out there. And then knowing that I was going, I went to uh, my agency, Panos Pictures, and they were interested in work from there. Um, this was in the early 90s. And uh, arranged to get out there. I knew I was going to be met at the airport. Uh, by by someone, and at the time, Njili Airport in Kinshasa was kind of a major African rite of passage. Like if you haven't been to Njili, you haven't really traveled to Africa. And I stepped off the plane onto the tarmac, and as the, the stories go, basically if you get through the terminal with your shirt on your back and, and any camera equipment, that's great because that, normally everything just disappears uh, as as you go through the terminal. And I was two steps from the door. I was kind of holding, hanging back, and I was two steps from the door. And somebody grabbed my shoulder, grabbed my elbow, and pulled me away. And it was the guy who was close to me. But I think you know, having having friends, having 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 good people on the ground, that's incredibly important. When you go on assignment, is it you on your own uh, a lot of the time, or do you find that you get assignments where you're able to go and work with a journalist as well? Uh, usually it's on my own, but I really, really like working with, with journalists, um, and that partnership can be very, very fruitful. You can com combine contacts, you know, the hustle that you make before, during, and after. You're, you're all working twice as hard, uh, working together for the same thing, which is trying to get a feature and get a place, get a place in the paper. Um, it's very, very important to stay neutral in the process of gathering the pictures, gathering, gathering the information. But in some cases, it's very, very difficult not to begin to take, take, take a position, to take a side. For instance, in Israel and the occupied territories during the you know, First Intifada, it's very difficult to, to see the, the relationship between the Israelis, the Israelis, the military, and the Palestinians and not, not be swayed a certain way. Well, you cover both sides in that particular photo story, didn't you? Definitely cover both sides. Definitely cover both sides. Uh, I think that's the most tense place I've ever been. 
like from the first day, I almost couldn't wait to leave. I was looking forward to leaving every single day. Um, we did stay about 10 days and talked to a range of people on both sides. And then on the assignments that you do, because you do travel to Africa, for example, quite a lot, as well as over to the Far East, and are there uh, elements of danger that you've had to face, and are there any precautions that you take to try and avoid getting into those kind of tricky situations? I think that the, the biggest precaution you can take is making sure you have good people on the ground and also good people back here in London who you sought out before the trip and perhaps you can work with NGOs, aid organizations, uh, maybe they can't give you money but if they can give you logistical help um, and introduce you to people what, what, in, in country, mm-hmm. that's incredibly valuable. That's, that's, then you kind of have somebody watching your back while, while you're there. Um, if you can arrange a fixer beforehand, fixers can be expensive, but you can get a fixer or a driver uh, while, when, you get, when you get in country. That, that's, uh, that's perhaps the most important thing you can possibly do. So you, you, get, you immediately get access to local knowledge, the benefit of local knowledge. That kind of echoes something which came up recently on one of the forums where somebody had asked, on behalf of a young female photographer who was going to go out to uh, Uganda, you know, and she was going to fly into Kampala and she wanted to, she was shooting for an NGO, I believe, and she wanted to spend a few extra days out there doing some personal stuff for herself and kind of, kind of innocently wanted to know, you know, what do I need to do? And, you know, so somebody had never been to, say, to uh, Uganda before or one of those countries that you visited. I mean, what sort of kind of advice would you give somebody? Yeah, but my first and most important piece of advice is always know how you're going to get from the airport to your hotel. Because once you're, the, if you're at the airport, you're kind of at the mercy of you've just landed, a little insecure, not knowing how things are done. Make sure and avoiding all the uh, all the people in the in the airport trying to sell you a taxi ride. Make sure you know how to get to that hotel and how much that costs. That really kind of settles things when you land. Um, and then you're in the hotel, and then you're you have a base to work from. You can start making decisions from there. Um, and what sort of hotels would you choose to stay in then? Is that, does that make a difference? Yeah, it really does. A, a, a secure hotel. I pay enough money so that uh, it's secure. Very difficult to know what secure is, uh, but I try and do some research beforehand, see if someone I know has stayed there before. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't stay in the cheapest places. I just can't. Um, but, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just changing tax slightly, um, with your, in your work experience, is there anything that's um, stood out as being the, that's one of your worst shoots or one of your bigger mistakes? That worst you'd shoot. Forget about? Worst shoot. It was kind of fairly recently. A couple of years ago, I got attached to uh, London Fashion Week and I was shooting backstage. Um, and the client, I repeatedly said before the shoot, accreditation. We need, I need a badge, I need something to get in and out of these spaces. Um, and no accreditation, and they just kind of whisked me in. And of course, immediately when I went out of backstage to go to the runway, um, I wasn't allowed to get in there. And the security people said, where's your accreditation? And they blagged me into the runway, the, the people I was with, the client people I was with. Um, and there's nowhere to put my cameras. There's nowhere to put my camera bag. So I put it down by the side of the, the scrum at the end of the runway. Um, and went away and took pictures of celebrities in the front row and came back and my bag was gone. And at that point I noticed there was a door kind of cut into a wall, which I stepped through. And behind, behind the, the scrum of photographers is there's, there's, a, there's a, a, an area where Photographers go to process their images, and it's basically a media center. My bag was sitting in the corner, so I go to grab my bag and quickly go back out onto the uh, out to the catwalk. And a security guy was standing in, standing in, in in front of the door and said, "You're not going out there." And the music comes up, and the show is started, and I was supposed to be out there. <laughs> and uh, no, he wasn't. So the the client at the end of the show it only lasted like 10, 15 minutes. At the end of the show. Client comes comes over and said, "How is that? Did you get great pictures?" And I said, "No, absolutely not. I don't have any credentials, so I couldn't get the pictures." And it just kind of went from bad to worse at that point. Mm-hmm. So, access is everything. I think even that's when when you're when you're planning a trip. 
somewhere, access is everything. That's what you're doing with all that research. You're trying to build access. You know, the, the photographs will come if you can create that access for yourself. Very important to get all the pre-planning in then. Absolutely, mm -hmm. definitely. If you could take some time out from your career at the moment to uh, do anything that you wanted, are there any particular personal projects that you've been burning to do that you would like to, um, like to see materialize? I have a project of, I've already done some work on, um, on the loss of biodiversity and, and the urgency of that. So uh, the, the, my work in wildlife biology from way back in my undergraduate studies before I, before I started photography, it's been very interesting to fold that knowledge back into photography and have them come together in, in a really productive way. Um, I've shot in natural history museums and I take endangered and uh, extinct specimens and I shoot them in a very sort of simple way against um, solid, solid backdrops. Um, and with that goes a long caption story and just shooting a number of species. And so I've been doing this for a while. I'd like to shoot in, uh, I'd like to shoot in more museums and build that body of work and do design some other projects on the, on the, on the subject of uh, biodiversity and, and, and the loss of biodiversity. And what would your advice be to a young photographer starting out today, uh, wanting to get started in the business and do the same sort of thing as you've been doing? Yeah, I mentioned before, I talk to a lot of new photographers and a lot of, a lot of people who want to assist. Um, and, you know, they bring their portfolios in. I've always been really, really positive, looking for the good, looking for the, the really good work in there and the good ideas, um, and maybe advising them on how to restructure their work um, and, and to, to bring out the best of it. Um, and it is really, really difficult. I think since you know, 2009, um, we've seen huge changes in the industry, uh, and it is a lot more difficult to start out, in fact. But what I always tell what I, what I tell people is that there's always room for one more. Well, that's great. I think that pretty much brings things to a wrap. So I'll just say thank you very much for coming on today and um, great talking to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thanks.